Howdy folks. I uh, wanted to put out a video talking about um, the follow-up to the questions I had about the Play Booster. Now, Mark Rosewater put out the uh, Nuts and Bolts article, number 16, recently talking about the uh, set skeleton, the changes it would make to Limited. And I wanted to follow up on my concerns on uh, what the new commons are going to look like. So, just to uh, quickly address uh, the things we're looking for here, one is I want to see if there are any bad cards left that a new player would be able to identify. It's okay if that's, you know, secretly a good card in disguise or something, and just, are there cards uh, that are still bad that a new player can dis discover in terms of, like, power level. Uh, another question I want to answer is, how's the mana fixing? Uh, they said in the article that they wanted to be careful about um, how much mana fixing uh, the set has access to, whether green is only going to, you know, make green mana when it ramps, uh, whether it can search for any type of land or only lands off the top of the library, that kind of thing. Because uh, they want to make it difficult to cast the rares of the set and to make like a five color, you know, good stuff deck. So, I'm going to follow up on that one. Uh, finally, you know, just uh, check in on a couple of things like how aggressive does the format look and just get more familiar with the set in general. First off, we've got Armored Armadillo, and I'm not going to try to do like a whole set summary here. Um, I just want to uh, do kind of a, a skim a little bit. So the Armadillo's got four toughness, um, and it doesn't look unplayable to me. You know, late in the game, you can pump up its power. Uh, early in the game, it's a little bit hard to target. It's a very good blocker for the first several turns of the game. So this card looks playable to me. It looks kind of like a setup card for a, a deck that wants to go long. You know, it wants to have a board presence, stall the game, and then later on this can uh, help close it out for you. The high toughness uh, runs counter to something that they talked about in the article around blue, where uh, they said that they wanted to, you know, keep an eye on how many high toughness creatures they have in the format. That, that can make it, uh, you know, too much of a stalemate, difficult to deal with. Now this format's interesting in that there are uh, token creatures running around that can pump up something's power at sorcery speed. So if the opponent has enough of those little mercenaries and they're willing to uh, tap out on their turn, they might be able to force something through your defenses or at least force a trade out of you. But that could also expose them to a counterattack. So uh, maybe the toughness isn't as much of a problem as I think. Maybe uh, there will be some tools to punch through. Or maybe this is going to be a slower format and I would welcome that. Uh, there have been way too many fast formats lately. Uh, Bridal Bighorn, again, this uh, has higher toughness than power. And it has Vigilance. It's interesting. Uh, this also makes little tokens when it attacks, which uh, clogs up the board with uh, more chump blockers. So this one could potentially play into a board stall as well. Um, See how that goes. Uh, Lullaby looks fine. So far I haven't seen anything that looks outright unplayable. Holy cow. So this is a 2-2 flash flyer for three. That would probably be okay. Um, on top of that, when it ETBs, you gain two life and scry one. So anything that's coming in... Uh, you have to be aware when there are flash creatures in the format. So anything that's coming in could run headlong into a holy cow. And uh, 
that and the life gain means that this is potentially another thing that's slowing the format down. You know, flash decks can also play like a tempo offense game. But I'm not sure if that's what this is setting up. I feel like this is maybe something you flash in and it trades with the opponent's uh, flying creature, you know? Because it seems like there's a lot of high toughness blockers in this format, including for flyers. Uh, seems very playable, seems a little power corrupt, honestly. Inventive Wingsmith, this is one of the high toughness creatures I was talking about. So it's a 2-4 for 3, that would be playable anyway. But at the beginning of your end step, if you haven't cast a spell from your hand this turn, and it doesn't have a flying counter on it, you put a flying counter on it. Uh, it's a heck of a blocker. Shuts down, you know, two toughness uh, attackers all day long. So this card seems really good and uh, quite defensive in the early part of the game. Uh, the Tether, this is, you know, something that exiles artifacts or creatures. You can play it for five, um, and it has flash. Um, so this seems really playable as well. Outlaw Medic, it has lifelink and high toughness. Uh, there seems to be a lot of roadblocks that I'm seeing in terms of early offense. And uh, does that mean this is going to be a slow format? I don't know. We'll see how much the mercenaries can uh, push offense. And on top of being a 1-3 lifelinker, when this dies, you draw a card. So again, seems pretty playable. Stage coach security. 4-5 for 5. You can plot it for 4. Uh, when it ETBs creatures you control, get plus 1, plus 1, and gain vigilance. There's a limit to the number of 4 and 5 drops you can play in a deck. This one seems fine, though. It's got a team pump effect. Reasonable body. Steer clear. One white instant. Uh, two damage to attacking or blocking creature. That's playable anyway. Uh, four damage instead if you control a mount. So, really good removal in a mount deck. But not bad otherwise. If this really does end up being less of an aggressive format and more of a, you know, kind of mid-range or go-long format. This might not be as good as it looks unless you're in the mount deck. Sterling Keykeeper. So, 2-2 two, two for 2. Pay 2 and tap, and you can tap target non-mount creature. Uh, so this is interesting. You can't stop a mount from blocking. So if the opponent's got a mount, uh, you're stuck. Can't get, can't get that thing out of the way with this. And if you want to tap something down to where it can't uh, saddle, you need to do that on their upkeep, right? Because if they get to their main phase, they can just sorcery speed do it, and you've missed your window. You can't get a blocker out of the way if it's a mount. You also can't prevent an attacker if it's a mount, and it's hard to prevent things from saddling it, too. Right? You can... You can tap something down on their upkeep that you already know about, but if they cast a new creature that's capable of saddling the mount, then, again, this won't stop it. Uh, it looks like a playable card, and it's probably fine, but maybe it's not as good as it looks in this format. I'm curious. Sterling Supplier. 3-4 Flyer for 5. Kind of forgettable. Again, it's got higher toughness than power. When DTBs put a counter on another creature you control. There's only so many of these you can play in a deck, but it seems fine uh, with the extra plus one counter. It's maybe better than it looks. Again, it's hard to, uh, hard to call anything outright bad. That makes it tough on new players uh, being able to identify power level. Take up the shield, this is a reprint, um, puts out a plus one counter at instant speed, and gives lifelink and indestructible. So again, this is more lifelink, more life gain that we're seeing here. Uh, it's as much a defensive trick as it is an offensive trick. Um, prolongs the game with the lifelink. So 
Again, I'm wondering if this is maybe going to be a slower format. I'm hopeful. Trained Arynx. This is a 3-1 for 2. Uh, so it's a mount. It can get first strike when it's saddled. So uh, it seems like there's a lot of high toughness in this set. If you have mercenaries, I think you could push this thing through by getting it up to 4. But... I've seen enough things that have like four toughness going around that this this might have trouble actually uh, getting through on the ground. Maybe there will be the tools for it, but uh, then again, maybe it's not as good as it looks. Vengeful Townsfolk, 3-3 three, three for 3. As soon as one of your creatures dies, it becomes a 4-4. Four, four. Uh, and that is a really good rate. So... Yeah, I, I think this card uh, looks pretty good. Wanted Griffin. This one I think I can identify as bad, but I don't know if a new player would necessarily identify it as bad. So white and blue both have access to flashing in a 2-2 flyer. Then there's, um, you know, like a 3-4 flyer we looked at, a 2-4 that can gain flying. Um, it just seems like there's enough things that can get in the way of this that uh, this is potentially a bit of a trap. It might not be as good as it looks. That being said, you know, if you trade it away, at least you're getting a mercenary on the back end of it. So this, this still might be okay, but I just think maybe it's not as good as uh, you would hope. Looking across white, it seems like there's not that many obvious choices for a new player to tell a bad card. Um, as for the format, I'm, I'm hopeful it's going to be slower from what I'm seeing. Daring Thunder Thief just looks amazing. Um, flashing in a 4-4. Uh, <laughs> that sounds great. It ETB's tapped. Even if you play it on your own turn, it ETB's tapped. So you cannot get it as a blocker. Not on turn 4. But... It can definitely upset the opponent's combat plans to flash this in at the end of their turn. Um, changes up the math a lot. One of the interesting things about a format that has flash creatures in it like this is uh, it makes the opponent hesitate more on committing to an attack because if you flash in a bunch of stuff at the end of their turn and come in with a nastier crackback against them, uh, sometimes it's Better to keep things on defense, and it can lead to more of a stall in the game. Jin of Fool's Fall. Um, it's a forgettable flyer, but it's nice that you can plot it. The stats are at least up to the point that it can uh, crash in to try to close the game or trade with an opposing flyer. So, seems alright. Failed forwarding. Um, a little bit forgettable, but, you know, if you want a tempo play. Geyser Drake looks good. 2-3 um, Flyer. It's going to be a good blocker. Make some good trades. And then uh, spells you cast that are not on your turn cost one less. This card just seems all the way around pretty great. Carrier Strix might not be as good as it looks. Um, there could be a tempo deck in the format that wants this card. And, of course, any deck late in the game can benefit from the, uh, you know, pay three, draw, discard. So in that regard, it's not too bad. But if you're not in a tempo deck, I feel like this card's maybe a bit of filler for you. I think you really got to push if you want to make the tempo deck a thing. Uh, Jailbreak Scheme, this is maybe not that great of a card. Putting a creature on top of its owner's library for three at sorcery speed. We've had a lot of cards do this for four in recent sets. Some of those were instants. Um, at three mana, it's a more reasonable rate. Um, the other mode on the card is really expensive. And it's at sorcery speed. I think maybe this card's not that great. Um, maybe it's not going to be that high of a pick. 
Will that be obvious to a new player? Hard to say. Lone Shark. Um, reasonable stat line. And then a good payoff if you're in the plot deck, you know. If you plot this thing, then you can get its trigger for casting two or more spells, since this one's for free. So, looks pretty playable. Uh, the Rope Master, 4-4 four, for four, 5. ETBs return a up to one tapped creature to its owner's hand. Might not be that great. Um, it's okay, though. You know, if you've got a board stall, adding a 4-4 four, is okay. If you're in a tempo race, bouncing the opponent's... Uh, you know, thing that they're getting in with is at least not the worst idea most of the time. And you could bounce your own thing, which is a little weird, but if it's got a good enough ETB trigger, maybe. Uh, this card's pretty forgettable. Phantom Interference. So this is uh, the Flash 2-2 in blue, which uh, again makes the, uh, the white 3-2 look worse. Uh, can also be a reasonable counterspell, you know, like a quench or whatever. Miscalculate. Sometimes you'll be able to add those together and it'll be an amazing spell. But um, it's alright at a baseline. Razzle Dazzler. 1, 2 for 2 whenever you cast your second spell each turn. Put a plus 1 counter on this. It can't be blocked this turn. So I am really up in the air on whether this is a great card or a not great card. I gotta gotta get to know the format better before I can tell. So maybe a new player would think this is bad, and maybe that would be safer for a new player. Because building this deck might be hard to pull off. So if it looks bad to a new player and it takes a more experienced player to turn it on, then that's uh, that's not the worst thing. Seize the Secrets. Um, this is either fine or pretty great. If you can really reliably commit crimes, then obviously drawing two for two mana is a fantastic deal. Slickshot Vault Buster. We've had some creatures with a similar stat line to this in recent sets, and they've not really gone anywhere. It's a blocker if you need it. Um, and if you can reliably commit crimes, a 3-4 with Vigilance for 3 would be pretty amazing. But uh, it's hard to tell whether it's going to be garbage or, uh, or nice, or only nice for the deck that wants it. By the way, I like a lot of the art of this set. Um, this outfit is super cute. Spring Splasher. This is a 2-1 for 2. Whenever it attacks, target creature defending player controls gets minus 3 power. Uh, seems pretty bad. Could always surprise me, I guess. But I remember some spirits and other creatures like this um, from Innistrad that weren't really that great. <laughs> I suspect this one won't really be that great either. It'll be a fine blocker, of course. Stop cold, I guess the flash on this makes it a bit like um, Tamiyo's Completion. Uh, it's probably a fine spell for uh, limited play. Take the Fall looks like it'd be pretty good, especially in the deck that has uh, Outlaws wants to commit crimes. Probably more of a tempo deck. So out of blue, is there anything that seems obviously bad to a new player? Maybe Jailbreak Scheme and the Frog? Black. Alright, Ambush Gigapede. So this is one that probably does look pretty bad to a new player. Um, people have probably warned new players at some point about things that cost too much mana. It has very low toughness. So that's a thing. Uh, the interesting bit about this card, though, is I'm not sure if it's actually bad. If this is as slow of a format as I'm hoping it'll be, this 
could be a playable card. I'm not saying it'd be a great card. But again, you got another giant flash thing that makes the opponent hesitate on crashing in for combat when you got mana untapped. It can kill anything with two toughness. It can throw off the combat math wildly. If you have, you know, this much mana open, you can flash it in. So, is the card actually bad? I'm not... I'm not 100% on that. But I think it would look bad to a new player, probably. Black Snag Buzzard, I think this card is bad because there are too many things that can kill a two-toughness flyer. Um, but it's not maybe immediately obvious. Uh, Desecrator. Seems like it's got a fine stat line. Really cool art. Um... And it's neat that it can grow itself. Consuming Ashes, this is a fine removal spell for limited. Uh, Corrupted Conviction, as long as you're doing something kind of like aristocracy, then this is fine. And honestly, it's okay even if you're not. You know, if you just hold this open long enough in a game, at some point you're probably going to be able to respond to an opponent's combat trick or removal spell with a Corrupted Conviction. So it's, it's never like that dead of a card in a typical game of Limited. Desert Stew is pretty good off the floor, so, you know, obviously it's got a higher ceiling with Deserts. Desperate Bloodseeker seems kind of absurdly good. Two two lifelinkers for two have been playable and Limited for, well, long as I can remember. And this one has target player mills two cards. You don't even have to target yourself. You probably want to. You probably would get added benefit out of your graveyard. But if you don't, or if you think that game's going to come down to milling, you can target the opponent. And it's a good playable card anyway. Now that being said, if this is a more defensive format then maybe this only is good if you pair it up with a bunch of mercenaries who can pump its power. And that still means it might just trade away, but at least you'll be able to get in there and threaten the opponent's creatures. It'd be interesting if, uh, you know, two twos for two are not that great in this format. If there's so much, like, defense and higher toughness that maybe it's not as good as it looks. That'd be interesting to me. Fake Your Own Death, I think this is a reprint. It's good, playable. You know, plus two power trick, plus, uh, you know, you can scam something back into play. Gets its ETB triggers all over again, you get a treasure. Just useful card all the way around. Mourner's Surprise, this one's probably not as good as a new player would think that it is. So this is probably like a learning opportunity here. Um, usually you don't want to be picking like raised dead effects that highly. But I will say you've got the option, the mode on this card, that you could just play it to get a 1-1 mercenary. It would be pretty bad in that mode, but it's an option. Azumi Link Breaker, this card is better dead than alive. It's just a 1-1 one, one for 1. Um, when it dies, it turns into a 1-1 one, one that can pump plus one power at sorcery speed. So it's just better after it's dead. Uh, it's worth noting this can like trigger a uh, outlaw entering or leaving the battlefield a couple of times. So this is pretty good in an aristocrat's deck. It's probably not bad in outlaws. Um, Maybe there's some other hidden potential on this one. I think it's probably not that great, except in the archetype that wants it. Uh, Overzealous Muscle. So if you're committing a crime, it has to be during your turn. Then this gains indestructible. Uh, this one might be a learning opportunity for a new player. It seems like this one is not that great. I could be misjudging it. 
you know, if it's really easy to turn this on, then maybe it's one of the ways you can start just coming in to try to close out the game. But it looks like it's not that great to me. And maybe a new player wouldn't uh, figure that out immediately. Raven of Fell Omens. We've got Stormcrow. Whenever you commit a crime, each opponent uh, loses one, you gain one. Triggers once per turn. I like this thing. Seems like an interesting build around. I don't know that you can get in with it if the opponent has open mana. Because it'll just flash in a 2-2 flyer and eat the raven. Uh, I like what it's doing with crimes, though. So, uh, it's hard to tell whether this card's good or bad until I see more of the format. It's not a good attacker. I'll say that. There's all kinds of pitfalls for trying to attack with this thing. Rooftop Assassin, 2-2, two, two, uh, Flash Flying Lifelink. ETBs destroy target creature and opponent controls, so it's dealt damage this turn. Eh. It's nice that it has Flash. It's nice that it has Lifelink. Maybe you can, you know, equip this thing up, put some auras on it, kind of Voltron it into a win condition. Maybe sometimes you'll kill something of the opponents, right? Like a high toughness blocker. But I'm really not that impressed with the 2-2 flyers because it seems like there's a lot of ways to just stall out or trade um, in the air in this set. So, and again, this is one in black, so now white's got a flash flyer, blue's got a flash flyer, black's even got a flash flyer. Seems like trying to get in with a storm crow or even like a 3-2 flyer or whatever is just gonna end in sadness. Skullduggery. Um, so I remember this card. Um, this came from uh, Ixalan, right? One of the Ixalons. There were pirates involved. Uh, it was great. Um, it doesn't look like much, but I remember it being amazing in that set. Probably still is amazing. Um, if aggro is not very good in the set, then Skullduggery is probably going to taper down a little in how effective it is. Still a very playable card, though, I would say. Maneuvering combat math this much in your favor uh, can be a real blowout for just one mana. Vault Plunderer, I like this thing. Um, so this reminds me of the 4-1 uh, for 4 in black. Um, it was a somewhat playable blocker in uh, Phyrexia All Will Be One. Right? It had value attached to it. It could trade with just about anything. And uh, I think it would draw you a card in some fashion. This one, trade with just about anything, draws you a card. So uh, this one I like for trying to, you know, if you got a high toughness blocker and then you got the vault plunderer, now the opponent's got kind of no good options left, right? They could try to pump up something's power with the mercenaries and you just trade with the vault plunderer instead of uh, throwing away your high toughness blocker. All right, so uh, cards a new player could tell is bad in black. Maybe the Ambush Gigapede, and I'm not even sure if it's bad. It depends on the format. Deadeye Duelist, we've got a three toughness reach creature. And this one, um, you know, it's got a long-term source of damage to the opponent, and it turns on um, crimes, right? If you need to be committing crimes in your deck, then the Deadeye Duelist is probably a, a top pick for you. And again, like a three toughness reach creature, just two power flyers seem like they're not cutting it in this format, unless you're pumping them up. Uh, discerning Peddlers, obviously great. You know, basically it helps you smooth out your draw. You can dig for land if you need land. You can dig for spells if you need spells. 
Explosive derailment is obviously great. Highway robbery, not bad. Um, you know, it'd be better if it was an instant. Um, you can play it kind of like, a, you know, thrilling discovery. You can also sacrifice a land to draw two cards. And if you don't want to do either of those modes, uh, you can wait until later in the game and just plot this thing when you got two mana to spare. So, seems like it's uh, got a lot of neat tricks, probably for a deck that's got the synergies, where you want to cast two spells a turn, stuff like that. Derasable Wolverine. This is a 3-2 for 3, which is okay. Pretty forgettable. Maybe really forgettable if this ends up being like a defensive format that's kind of slow. But in that case, you plot this thing and you get a free spell off of it. And in that case, it goes from being bad to not bad. So I think either way you go, this is a pretty decent creature. Iron Fist Pulverizer. We got a high toughness reach creature again. Just uh, another thing that's like creating the battlefield presence, shutting down offense, stalling the game. It's interesting how much of these I'm seeing. Uh, whenever you cast your second spell each turn, this deals two damage to the opponent and you scry. So I don't know how great that part of this card is, but the body's fine. Mine Raider, I think this is going to be kind of bad. I think if you are in the Outlaws deck, where you're getting the treasure token, then this is pretty playable. I think otherwise this is a super forgettable card, if you don't have an Outlaw. Outlaws Fury, this one will be good if the aggressive deck can be good. And if it's not, then this is like unplayable garbage. <laughs> Uh, it is nice that it gives you an extra card you can play until the end of your next turn. If you control an outlaw. Prickly Pear is obviously amazing. Quick Draw, I'm actually not sure whether this is going to be good or bad in this format yet. Um, you know, combat tricks are always marginally somewhat playable. But it depends on depends on the tempo of the format, really. Well, Charger looks a little forgettable, but it would be a totally serviceable uh, blocker to just trade with. And if you're in a position where uh, you can be taking the front foot on offense, getting in with a 5-5 minutes would be pretty decent. Um, I think maybe it's a little easier to tell that this one's not as strong as some other options. Reckless Lackey, even if aggressive... Uh, decks are not that good in this format, I still don't think I can say Reckless Lackey is bad. Because you can always just pay three and sack it to draw a card, make a treasure token. You can do that at instant speed, so you can like block on the opponent's turn, um, just chump and sack this thing. So even if aggro is not a thing, this is still not a bad card. Rodeo Pyromancers, um, is this, like, amazing? It doesn't say when you cast your second spell each turn. It says when you cast your first spell each turn, you add two red. Um, so it feels like if you set this up, then um, you're usually going to be able to cast a first spell. <laughs> and if you're, you know, drawing cards, or if you're just in the early parts of the game, you should be able to get this thing to land you some nasty double spells. Um, even if it only does this trick once or twice in the game for you, still, that could be a big burst of mana. Uh, Thunder Salvo is pretty playable even at the floor, you know, or it's just like two damage for two mana at instant speed, so it's fine. Trick Shot seems playable too, six damage at instant speed and it could hit a creature token for two, in addition. Um, this might be really good. So if I was a new player, I was looking at the red cards, do any of them stand out as being um, easy to tell that they're bad? No. No, if I was a new player, I think all of these look pretty playable. 
Ankle Biter, obviously good. Um, Death Touchers are always useful. Bristle Pack Sentry. You know, if this ends up being um, a slower format, I don't know how much you need this. It seems like it would be good to stop an early aggressive deck. Hector Angela. Uh, so Plant Spider, cheaper if you have a Desert, Reach, draw cards if the opponent targets it. Pretty obviously good. Dance of the Tumbleweeds. So this can ramp you on three. Um, and it can color fix you, um, you know, mana fix you. So uh, that's not amazing. Uh, if you do pick uh, something that comes in untapped, then you could use the mana right away. That's interesting. Uh, for 5 mana, you could get a big elemental, and then for 6 mana, you get a really big elemental. Seems pretty obviously playable. Uh, Drover Grizzly turns on the 4 power synergies. Don't know if that deck is good or not. Um, this could be a card that's like secretly kind of bad. <laughs> At least it blocks well, right? It's going to trade with whatever's coming in. So there's that. Free Strider Commando can be a 3-3 three, three for 3. If you plot it, it'll be a 5-5 five, five for 4. So, uh, good modality, playable card. Apparently there are some middle schoolers who are designing some cards at Wizards of the Coast, because uh, one of the mounts we have is a giant beaver. Uh, I don't see a river anywhere near. So, uh, what's this beaver doing here, other than being like a... A joke? <laughs> it's a 4-4 with Vigilance for 4. It's obviously playable. Um, right? And then if you saddle it, you can put a counter on the thing that saddled it. It's obviously a playable card. Hard Bristle Bandit. Taps for mana of any color. This is interesting. So they specifically said they weren't going to do this with green. They were going to start making... You know, cards that find lands off the top instead of like searching for lands like the other one. Things that would just tap for green mana instead of mana of any color. They had the opportunities to do that here. They did not. Um, it looks like we've got good color fixing in this set. So yeah, um, mana dork fixes mana, accelerates mana, and if you commit crimes, you can untap it. Um, to make even more mana. Seems excellent. Uh, the Naturalist, 2-3 three for 3. You can mill 3 cards and get a land, and if you don't find one, you get a treasure token, which again, makes any color of mana, ramps you. So, seems like they're not being shy at all about finding uh, the mana and the colors that you need. Reach for the sky. Uh, makes me think of... Uh, you know, Woody from Toy Story. Somebody's poisoned the water hole. <laughs> so this is a flash aura. Give something plus three, plus two in reach. And it replaces itself when it goes to the graveyard with drawing a card. Uh, this is probably going to be one of the more forgettable cards of the set. They've made auras as good as they can make them in recent years, and they still usually don't see much play. Probably going to be the same for this one. Snakeskin Veil, obviously amazing. Spinewoods Paladin, clearly playable at least. 5-4 Trampler, gains you 3 life. Play it for 4, play it for 5. Yeah. Throw it from the saddle. So 2 mana Sorcery. So, a creature you control gets plus one, plus one, one way or another. If it's a mount, it gets a plus one counter. Otherwise, it's until end of turn. And then it deals damage equal to its power to a creature you don't control. So this is a bite spell. It's at sorcery speed. It's got a plus one boost. Um, overall, 
very playable card. It's going to be very good. Tumbleweed Rising. Maybe this is a card that a new player could identify as being a little weaker. Because you've already got to have another creature in play with high power before you're really getting much of a body off of this thing. You know, if, if the best you can do is like you play a 2-2 two, two, and then you play this thing and you get another 2-2, two, two, that's, that's not exciting at all. Now you could plot it and hope that later in the game you could get a bigger thing, but still it requires you to have another creature on the battlefield, so this might be either something that a new player can identify or could quickly learn is not that strong of a card. Uh, varmint's at least alright. You know, at least you get a warm body on the field that can destroy an artifact or enchantment, even if a 2-2 is not that relevant. Um, at some point in the game, you can sacrifice it to kill an artifact or enchantment. Seems like it could come up. So, probably a fine card. Kind of like being able to play a sideboard card in your main deck. So as far as new players, I think like Reach for the Sky and Tumbleweed Rising are maybe like the learning opportunities. I don't know if they're immediately obvious to a new player, but they should be cards they figure out a little faster. And the artifacts. Uh, Gold Pan makes a treasure token, so that's ramping you and fixing your mana for at least a turn. And then it's a totally usable piece of equipment. Gives plus one, plus one, equips around for one. Uh, yeah, just totally playable card all the way around. Oasis Gardener, two, two for three, gains you two life, and taps for one mana of any color. Again, they could have made this tap for colorless mana. They could have made it filter mana. They could have made it only tap for green mana. They could have, there's a lot of things they could have done with the design of this. Uh, but instead we have really good color fixing in the set. Even though the body on this is not that exciting, gaining two life is a meaningful offset. Silver Deputy. Make sure you hit your next land drop. And then it can uh, pump power. So totally serviceable card here. And the Sterling Hound. So usually three twos for three are... Playable if forgettable um, in limited. At the very least, it's a good blocker. You know, it can probably trade nicely with something at some point in combat. And when the CTBs, you surveil two, that can help you get to a color of mana that you need in a multicolor deck. All right, it doesn't guarantee it, but it lets you dig deeper into the deck to either find a spell you can cast or a color of mana that you need. Um, these uh, surveil artifact creatures, like we just had one in Karlov Manor, really smooths out the game. So this will probably do the same thing. I don't think any of these are obviously bad to a new player, and I don't think they are bad. And the lands. So there's the uh, tap desert cycle. It makes two colors of mana and deals damage to the opponent. All of these trigger uh, crimes. So that's worth noting. It also means we got good color fixing in this set. Between all the things that just, you know, make treasure or just tap for any color of mana on their own, uh, or all of these lands we have access to that make two colors, I think splashing is going to be pretty easy in Outlaws of Thunder Junction. Uh, we got Conduit Pylons. Here's another land that's going to smooth things out for you. Makes colorless, or you just pay one and tap, add one mana of any color. It gets a surveil one when it enters the battlefield, so I think you would maybe run this card even in a monocolor deck, just for the free surveil and an untapped land. So, uh, yeah, I don't know what deck wouldn't run Conduit Pylons in it. We got the Mirage Mesa, so again, this is a common desert. Comes in tapped, you get to choose a color, make some mana of that color. So got like all the mana fixing you could ask for, it seems like. 
All right, so some of the things I was afraid of um, with the play boosters, I was afraid that um, the uh, power level of the commons would be very flat, that the cards could be bland, that it could lead to um, a more boring format. I was worried that um, if they refused to increase the toughness on the creatures, that it could just lead to more fast formats and more aggro. And I was concerned that the lack of color fixing and the increased number of two-color uncommons and uh, increased number of rares with all of their colored pips might make it to where there's a format with a whole bunch of cards going around that people can't cast. And it looks like that's not what's happening here. Um, I think it's okay to look yourself in the mirror once in a while and uh, admit when you're wrong. And I think that, you know, I've still got my concerns. You know, there's what they said they would do, and I'm still concerned about the things they said they would do. But that's not what they've actually done. They've given us all the color fixing in the world. Um, they've given us an interesting spread of commons. So even though there's more difficulty, I think, for a new player in determining what the bad cards are, I think um, the synergies that they're setting up for the different draft archetypes and stuff make it a little bit easier to tell when a card's not for you and it's not for your deck. You know, I was worried you'd have to look at, like, every card in your color, or even worse, like every card in the pack, to determine if, uh, you know, it was a playable card for you or not. But I think with the way they're engineering the, uh, the draft archetypes, it seems like it's more obvious to tell when there's a lane over here that's not your lane and you don't want to pull into that one. So, overall, I kind of like what I'm seeing, and... Uh, my initial impression is this feels a lot like the great color fixing that we had for March of the Machines. And that draft format was a hoot. Uh, a hoot and a half. <laughs> yeah, um, there were lots of rares. You know, there were like bonus sheets and all kinds of funky rares and stuff. On Arena, there was even like a mode for a while where they replaced a common slot with an Aftermath card. It was a wild format, high power level, all kinds of weird cards running around. It was a lot of fun. And it feels like that's going to be the case here as well. So I think I'm going to enjoy this limited format, and I think it's going to slow down a little bit compared to some of the ones we've seen recently. It feels like it's going to be possible to make like a weird build-around deck or to make a ramp deck push a little longer, a little later into the game, depending on how you build, depending on what choices you take. I think the mercenaries might still make, you know, aggro an option. But I hope that there's going to be a diverse array of gameplay and that we're going to be able to splash in all the rares and have a bunch of fun with this set. Maybe that's not what their intention was, but it feels like that's what their intention was here. So uh, I'm looking forward to putting up some drafts on the channel. The drafts are never as popular as the uh, standard decks, but I'm a free-to-play account, and it's what I do. I do my collection building when the set first comes out, play my drafts, and I enjoy drafting. And then later, once I've built up a bit of a collection, then I do the deck building toolbox series, spend some of my rare wild cards, and then I, you know, go on to build my standard decks. So stick with the channel for all of that coming up. I might do a box opening video at some point. Um, I am looking forward to getting my hands on this set. Hopefully tomorrow they'll have spoiled all of the cards from uh, the big score, and I can do a follow-up video on the big score. So until then, like and subscribe. Check out my other videos. Helps out the channel a lot. And uh, never stop honing your critical thinking and empathy.
Padre.